This is Trip, and this is a Theology Nerd Throwdown. This is where nerds of the theological variety come to throw down. Why? Why not? Yeah, that's right. Anyway, on the TNT this week, Greg Horton, ex-pastor, um, one of the most popular guests last year on Homebrewed Christianity, and uh, on top of being an ex-pastor living in Oklahoma, he is also a journalist. And this is our first TNT special uh, for the election. Um, Greg and I are going to have a few conversations, um, you know, whenever it makes sense through the election to talk about religion and politics and culture and who knows what's going to happen and go on. But uh, anyway, we decided let's just kick it off and talk about some rather crazy topics that we just think everyone, especially ministers, should be having in their head. Uh, given uh, the oncoming onslaught of really crazy religion and politic interactions. So I just want to tell you, before we jump into the podcast, that this podcast, The Theology Nerd Throwdown, is not the only thing going on at homebrewedchristianity.com. If you don't know, there's a whole show where we interview people, and Khaled Keith Perry just interviewed Jennifer Burr on her book about the Bible, and it's a Bible book for normal people called Permission Granted. Talk about sex and violence, where the Bible came from, and all that exciting stuff. You should check it out. You should also check out the Lectio cast. That's a lectionary podcast with the good doctor, Daniel Kirk. And that's right, the first four episodes I did with him currently just dropped the second episode. It's him and the Bo Daddy. And the thing is, any time that you get the Bo Daddy and Daniel Kirk talking about the Bible, giving ministerial, like, prophetic preaching advice, it is not anything you want to miss. So check out the Lectio cast. Also, check out the brand new episode of the Culture Cast. TJ, Tony Jones is on there talking about his new book, Did God Kill Jesus?, which he's talked about on Homebrewed, but he also talks about cyberbullying and stuff like that. Plus, there's lots of other cool stuff after the interview, including information about this live show that me, Amy, and Christian are going to be having, sponsored by Friends Phillips Theological Seminary, at the Disciples of Christ General Assembly in Columbus, Ohio, in July. And, I, you know, like the thing is, if you're going to be in Columbus, Ohio, or I don't know, maybe you live there, or you're a Disciples of Christ person, and this is your, like, every two years, big gathering, um, then, uh, you know, tell me you're going to be there and you want to hang out, get a, get a brew and such, because all the tickets to that live event are sold out. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I, I should have told you earlier if you wanted to come and didn't, but I I had no idea that... It was like the culture cast people heard about it. And then I sent it to our email list on Homebrewed. And if you got that email, you had like a day or two before all the tickets were gone. So if you didn't know, then make sure you sign up for the Homebrewed Christianity email list. If you go on to the website, homebrewedchristianity.com, that's right. You can sign up for our email list. And, you know, every week or so you get an email that says, like, here are all the people who got interviewed. Here's what's going on. Here's a new high-gravity class. Here's blah, 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 like that. You know? It's like a live events, all that kind of stuff. You know, you would have found out about that. Um, now, before we jump in, right to the TNT, I just want to tell you, all of you, thank you for listening. And I hope that you share this with your favorite theology nerd. And I hope that you all, soon and very soon, call the speak pipe. That is the glowing microphone button on the right side of the Homebrewed Christianity Hot page. And leave a question or a topic for a future TNT. That's right. I'm just asking for your input. Anyway, here we go. First, religion, politic, election year episode. Greg Horton, ex-pastor on... The tweeter, um, you know, popular, I guess, friend of mine, he's here, yeah, Boom. Hello, homebrew Christianity listeners, guess what, Greg Horton, the ex-pastor is back on the podcast, and uh, we are going to talk about religion and politics 
Uh, you know, because it's election time, friends. It is election time. What's up, Greg? Hey, man. What's up? I am excited to, excited to have you back on the podcast. And we should go ahead right before you jump in to tell everyone that uh, soon and very soon um, we will be discussing the end of religion. Yes, the, the uh, conference that uh, we did up at Villanova uh, in, I think that was March. So Caputo, Wes Fall, Simmons, and Jeffrey Blasting. Robbins. Oh. Robbins, yes, I liked him. By the way, um, those four. I think Trip's going to put the uh, you're going to put the stuff out there, and then we're going to do some conversations about the individual presenters and their presentations. Yeah, yeah. So we're, we'll put those out there, and there'll be four presentations. And uh, I'm going to open the speak pipe up and encourage and even bribe people to call in and tell us their <laughs> questions and thoughts about the end of religion, like what is ending with religion, maybe what religion is. Um, and all that kind of stuff. And then Greg and I will have a little uh, Theology Nerd Throwdown where we uh, talk about the presentations, his experience attempting to fill in for yours truly at a, at a live event, which is, which is just, you know, like that's like trying to fill in for the Pope, Greg. It's like – No, it was virtually impossible. People and, kept asking where, where you were, and I was like, I'm, I'm a human being. I'm a human being, sir. <laughs> well – didn't, didn't care. Yeah, so uh, – which, which I, I I was very glad that um, – that, that that you substituted because I I was trying to get a job then which is yes. I support being employed um and uh, anyway so we'll, we'll be collecting answers questions topics and stuff on the speak pipe you'll hear everyone talk and then we'll have some fun um but today we want to go ahead especially especially for those of you that are ministers to help you out and and, and give you some advice on what not to say during an election year. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe clear up some myths, um, point you in the right direction, uh, because there is no more embarrassing time as a Christian than when religious leaders start talking during presidential election season. I, this is one of the times where I think maybe Greg made a good decision. The decision to get out? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, you tell me. Like, it, the first time that you were, there was a presidential election post uh, leaving the church. Did you just feel better about yourself? Uh, can I tell you a really quick story about while I was in the church still? Y yeah, go for it. Okay, so I was an associate pastor at a, in an evangelical kind of a charismatic congregation here in Oklahoma City, and our pastor was one of those sort of knuckleheads that didn't really understand 501c3 and all it entailed. And so it was the election when it was Clinton versus Dole. And so rather than endorse a candidate specifically, or sorry, explicitly from the pulpit, he said, I'm not going to tell you who to vote for, but righteous people eat dull pineapples. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Right? <laughs> oh. The worst idea of all time. Uh, so That's, that was my, it was so very funny. subtle. It was subtle. <laughs> yeah, you, know, you see, yeah, subtle wasn't really his thing. Uh, so after getting out, it was the, you know, you get to these moments and all the language that you expect starts up the Christian America and principles of biblical values. And so it was kind of refreshing not to have to try to explain to people the difference between Jesus and the president. Um, but uh, even now, because I teach college and I teach a bunch of kids in Oklahoma, we have these conversations all the time. Mm -hmm. So uh, the first topic that came into my mind um, is, is what I seem to be a very essential truth for America. That uh, a good Christian and a public atheist could never be elected president. We need someone who believes in God a lot, like really loves some Jesus, except they aren't really going to pay attention to much of what he said. And we and, and so we need a we need a bad Christian uh, to run for office. Maybe a Catholic or or, or Jew, but we, you know, like we we have real real boundaries here definitely no atheists and you know like it's like a uh, nixon like nixon was theoretically a quaker right but we didn't want a good quaker no the pentagon would have gotten upset um we want nixon we you know, so so you know, the and the people like to joke like that jimmy carter was like an actual good christian which made him a horrible president right. um a better ex president so like as someone as someone who who uh uh, is no is is admittedly a skeptic and agnostic about these things. What is it like to look at a country where you know just how how uh, uh, lightly these very vocal Christians hold their convictions when running for office? But someone who who may have 
more passionate commitments to the justice-centered message of Jesus would never get elected president if they just said they didn't believe in a transcendent deity. Right. You know, this is, and most a lot of my illustrations come from class because it's what I do, and I do teach religion. And one of the things that comes up repeatedly is that people will not vote for certain groups. As you already have said, atheists couldn't get elected. Now, we did have, what was his name, Stark, I think, in California, was yeah. in Congress, and he was the only one, I think, that ever made it uh, as an explicit atheist. But the question that I always ask is, and this is, I think, you know, uh, fundamental. What exactly is the Christian person going to do in office that someone else can't do? I mean, do you really want Barack Obama or whoever's next to come out of a prayer meeting and then sit down with the joint chiefs or his cabinet and say, Hey, I was talking to God and he said, we should totally bomb the shit out of Iran. Uh, <laughs> you, you have to, every, anybody with any sense at all goes, yeah, I, I I don't know that we want to believe that necessarily. So the idea that there's somehow this connection matters in a pragmatic sense. What can a Christian or a Muslim or a Buddhist do in office that a an atheist can't? And you really can't argue the ethical side. Well, I want someone who follows the teachings of Jesus, like Harry Truman, the Baptist deacon who dropped atomic bombs on Japan. Yeah, of course. Yes, I can just imagine Jesus. Flying what about evil. what if you, as a Christian, just feel worse when you do it? Huh? Huh? <laughs> like you just nuke a bunch of people and you're like, I have to answer for this on Judgment Day. Does an atheist think that he's going to have to stand before the sweet Lord? And uh... <laughs> Right. No, it's they're actually better off. Honestly, if I have to pick a Christian tradition right now, I'm going to pick Catholic. Because at least they give a, a sort of nod to penance. You know, you do something wrong and you got to you got to help unbreak the world that you broke. Uh, whereas with evangelicalism these days, it's like as long as you ask for forgiveness, you're pretty good. You're you're going to be fine. And just don't do it again. And honestly, how many times in your life do you get a chance to blow people up with nuclear weapons? So it's not like you're going to repeat true. the sin, right? Yeah, he's pretty much absolved. It's more We're like good. a oncey. <laughs> <laughs> but this idea that somehow religion is going to affect the office is is not not based on anything that I even begin to understand. As you point out, Carter wasn't necessarily as bad as people say he was. The, the Iran sort of hostage crisis sort of colors his presidency. But up until Obama, no single president had fulfilled more of his agenda than Carter. It just so happens that conservative Americans didn't like Carter's agenda. And which correlates to how unbiblical he was. <laughs> yes, right, depending like, on which passage of the Bible you read through, which filter you are correct. I mean, you have on our list there, you know, the the, the prophets. Like you start talking about Amos and Micah and those guys. It's like uh, it's like Christians haven't even encountered those sort of passages about how they're supposed to behave. Yeah. But, so, yeah, but before we jump on that, we should just say, like, it one good thing to do as a minister during the election is probably not make every citizen of our country who's not as Christian, religious, spiritual as you feel like crap for being a citizen, right? Like I, I think that how obnoxious it must be to watch an entire stage of debating candidates for the world's largest, most deadly military of all time uh, pander to people who are fans of a homeless dead Jew who died a revolutionary facing off with the empire of his day. Like it, at some point, it's like you, you got to be sitting there if you're not on Team Jesus thinking that that you had someone roofie your drink, that this is not happening because it's just straight crazy unless you already bit the, the Christology pill kind of thing. But like outside of that, it's got to be weird for um for for someone who wants to be in charge of the Peacemaker missiles to also say that they call the one who said blessed are the Peacemakers Lord. Because I, I don't think he was like trying to, to like name uh, aerial destruction devices in the no, Sermon yeah. on the Mount. Right. You're, we're back to the Machiavellian distinction. And uh, uh, the, the simplified version people have heard before, but the more complex version of Machiavelli is where we are today. And he doesn't say don't be a Christian. He just wants to redefine goodness as strength and, and, and the will to do the right thing. And the right thing at the moment is not necessarily the Christian thing. So he says, use Christianity if it serves you, and if it doesn't, dispose of it, but then you can always pick it back up. And that's what we do, is it not? I mean, that's exactly what we do. That's why you get baptized the third and fourth time. <laughs> I just, I'm tired Greg, of Greg, are you ready to recommit your life? I, not yet. It'll take right. a while. <laughs> I'm just, I just want you to know I'm praying for you. 
you, well, you know, I, I, I live in the same city as Life Church, so if it's going to work, it's going to be a 32 foot screen that pulls me in. I promise you that. It's always what it's, it's the size that pulls you in. The walk into the light, walk into the light. Anyway, um, I just, it, it's going to happen. You know, it's going to happen. We're going to have this parade of people saying that they go to church or they're, they're this kind of Christian or that kind of Christian. And if religion doesn't make you behave a certain way in the world, what the hell is the point of it? It doesn't do anything. I, so it makes you sleep better at night and talks your teenagers into not screwing till they leave your house. Come on. Come on. There's a good no. point. Good point. One for Jesus. Uh, second thought, Amos and friends would totally be hating on us. Um, and, and, and if you just read the prophets, like the topics that we talk about today that the prophets pick up on are like immigration. And it's not a self-deportation model. If, uh, right. uh, in fact, I believe that in the Bible, it's crazy. Thus saith the Lord refers to that says we should treat aliens that live in our land as our firstborn. Anyway, debt forgiveness, that was a popular topic. Um, I don't know if it correlates to bailing out Wall Street or not, but uh, it may have something more to do with things like uh, uh, student loans, people whose houses went under and they lost their property investment and retirement and stuff. Anyway, there's a lot of things like that. Uh, Redistribution of capital, that was actually uh, something um, thus saith the Lord had feelings about. Uh, Foreign policy, uh, probably not as awesome as ours, but probably uh, supportive of Israel. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> yeah, that's probably true. Uh, I have a professor friend at Southern Nazarene, and every year he gives his intro. I think it's intro to Biblia. Uh, he gives his students a checklist of verses from the minor prophets, especially uh, as compared to political platforms in the United States. And most of his students, without knowing the political platform, tend to choose a particular party based on what the Bible says. And they're always surprised to discover that party, which most closely adheres to the minor prophets, is in fact the Green Party. Mm-hmm. And it's it's a sh- it's a shocking moment for them because they've come up against this sort of cognitive dissonance where everything they've heard about politics is suddenly revealed to be bullshit in light of what the Bible actually says. Yeah, yeah. I I I mean, it, it is one of those things that once you've read the Bible and thought it might be possible that something in here has to do with politics. That, like, once you assume that religion and politics are not completely different, separate spheres of existence, that they might have some relations, then you realize that politics is the most popular topic in the Bible, followed by money. <laughs> so, um, uh, but I don't, so, like, when you're engaging students and stuff, and what is it like for them the first time they realize that, uh, that, that the Bible actually discusses political power? And topics that we're debating from quote biblical perspectives uh, in, in in these election seasons. Yeah, uh, that's a great question. Um, it's <laughs> I would like to say that they fully understand the degree of conflict that's present in those kind of conversations, but they've been taught a particular method. I think virtually every American Christian I know was taught the same method, and that is when you hear something that's from the Bible that's counter to what you already believe to be true, then you simply find something else in the Bible that's not counter to that point. And so then they begin to prefer a particular set of texts over another set of texts, and they they don't want to talk about the text comprehensively. Uh, that's not a problem for someone like me or someone like you who understand the more complex you know, process of hermeneutics. But for them, it's always been this verse says this and this verse says that. So if I need to prefer Jesus to Moses or Moses to Jesus, I feel totally free to do that. And then when we get to the New Testament, of course, you prefer Paul to Jesus. So it's not as if these moments of sort of, you know, these epiphanies, if you will, create a moment of clarity for them. It just creates an opportunity to find another verse that says something different. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so. I, I, I think part of it is like it can get really frustrating, especially for progressive Christians who have to point this stuff out all the time. Um, that we fail as progressive Christians to realize just how there is not a party that really is super friendly with the kind of the justice claims of uh, in Christianity that like being a Democrat or being part of the Green Party or whatever does not remedy the issue. The issue in Scripture is actually whether or not an institution like our political economic one that we're a part of with such power and all that kind of thing has within itself the possibility of being um, a, a, a well, I don't know, Christian or good or biblical or just that 
the big question put in Scripture to the political powers of the day is always a question around power. And is it possible for <coughs> um, governments and institutions with that amount of power to really do good? Or is it a giant version of uh, of of us just protecting our our privilege through the oppression of the poor and the planet? And well, it's yeah, good for yeah. us not to recognize that we can sleep better. But like once you realize that's what's going on, it, yeah. it it's kind of like you know the degree of ugliness between our options available this election season will not be huge. I think you know. <sighs> The deal, the deal is that we have a, we prefer a particular tradition within Christianity, and, and that tradition doesn't look anything like the historical versions. And, and if you talk about the Anabaptists, what you're saying fits perfectly with what the Anabaptists used to say, which is that you probably should not be in politics at all if you are a Christian, because the the, the, the very sort of process of it is going to. I, I want to say it was Hubmeyer. I want to say it was Balthazar Hubmeyer. I was looking that up just now. Mm-hmm. Uh, was his whole take on this was that once you enter into this sort of relationship of church and state at that level, that your sort of priorities based on state demands are going to make it impossible for you to walk out this Christian life. Now, it just so happens, as you already know, that the Anabaptists were the only ones of the reformers who resisted the pull of the state's power in order to further its own ends. Uh, we have part of that tradition left. It's weak. It's feeble. It's living in the dark and not getting fed very much. That separation of church and state at that level. But one of the things that consistently comes up, and we we hit it, is if you're a good Christian, you should stay out of politics completely. Now, this changes, of course, in the early '70s and early '80s, when Francis Schaeffer and others push us back into politics because they decided piety was destroying the country. But it, it's not been a success story by any definition. It's 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 been terrible, in fact. Yeah, I I mean I like I always all my Anabaptist friends. I think they make sense, and then I want to go. Yeah, but well, the eschaton hasn't quite happened yet. So let's go ahead and and deal with things as as they are. My problem is less like be recognizing the inherent complicity any American citizen has that pays their taxes and all kinds of ugly stuff. That's like something I think you have to deal with and remain aware of and not wash and clean off. But I also think there's like, once you admit that things are screwed up, then you should be responsible with your voice and influence to make it not as crappy. But, you know, working against something being destructive doesn't mean you tell everyone it's the greatest thing on the planet. Right, like you could be a realist about it, and also realize that you're being realist about a broken, ugly system. Yes, and recognizing that doesn't also entail that I have to give you a solution that works. There's nothing wrong with pointing out what's wrong first, yeah, and then agreeing. I mean, listen, you know, I'm not a Christian. But it seems to me that if you're a minister at this point in, in America's political history, that what you get to do more than anything else is point out the impossibility of these sort of governmental systems to fix what is systemically wrong with the country. And you're supposed to have a better message, and that message is, is, is sort of transpolitical. Uh, but as you've already pointed out, religion is political. Now, to say that means we need to separate one reality. I don't mean that religion is political in the sense of it takes a side on gun control or you know Republican Democrat. I simply mean that the politics is this sort of science and art of getting along and, and you know t- t- treating with each other, treating each other a certain way. And clearly, religion historically has tried to say to us, "You should do these things if you want to live in community, and not do these if you don't." So at one level, it is it, it's a critique that should be offered all the time from pulpits. Which is why it's so important that pastors stay out of that fray in terms of which candidate you think is the best. Critique the system, critique the politics of power, critique the oppression of the poor. It doesn't matter who's oppressing them. Yeah, there's as many million there's as many millionaires on the Democratic side of the aisle as are Republicans. So it, it's 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 not as if either one of these two sides is pristine. Yeah. So Greg, um, do you really want a flag in your sanctuary? You know what. 
Okay. Another, uh, this is a really quick story. Uh, when I was working with a, a friend of mine who's now passed, Jeff Zerhide, he was the pastor at First Baptist Oklahoma City, and he was cooperative Baptist, you know. He's an East Coast guy. And he took the American flag off of the dais uh, all the time. And he would, and every, every week he would come back in, and it would be back up there. And he eventually learned there was an old man there that was, you know, just was not going to have it. So they started hiding the flag. So he would put it in a room, and that dude would search the whole church until he finally found the damn thing. And so finally Jeff just had to address it from the pulpit and say, look, the church is not a nationality. And anybody that comes here is welcome here irrespective of their country or their culture or their allegiance to the American flag. It does not belong in the sanctuary, period. Now, it reaches its full perversion in places like Dallas, and I want to say it was Preston Wood that did this, where they put a cannon – in the baptistry for 4th of July and had it shoot red, white, and blue confetti. <laughs> and if, if you don't realize that you have completely undermined the narrative of what the baptistry is supposed to be about by sticking. My eyes have seen the glory <laughs> of the coming of the Lord. It's, it's simultaneously cheesy as hell and horrifying. Could you imagine, like, that was your first Sunday visiting a church? <laughs> <laughs> you're, my last one. Yeah, you're like, it, you're like, you're kind of creeped out and you're leaving, but your kid's like, Dad, do they get to use cannons every Sunday? This is great. <laughs> <laughs> what, what I think the flag thing is pretty amazing is, um, so I, I, I couldn't figure out a nice way of saying it. But, you know, in light of what's happened in Charleston, there are a lot of people who are insisting that this that the Confederate flag go down. Right. Like yeah. how many of those people they're complaining on in Facebook have American flags in their sanctuaries? A bunch. Exactly. Now, I think they're both gross, like to be the flag that symbolizes everything that is ugly about our southern heritage. And I'm I'm a southerner. Like right. grandpa in the Senate of the Confederacy Southerner. So right. like I understand the heritage part and all that kind of thing. It's just like if you have something that when it, it shows up, the ancestors of people you used to own feel horrible, ugly, and mistreated, then you take it down, otherwise admit you're being a dick. That's just kinda like like whatever you're protecting by protecting that flag is very, very, very small compared to being a decent human being. And as a minister, when you see that happen, right, I've right. talked to Southerners who could not understand why it was everyone else can't understand, oh, this is part of our heritage, blah, blah, blah. And as a minister, in your head, you say, if you had a decent pastoral counseling class, when someone is defensive over a symbol but is unable to articulate it, then you – Refer them to a professional counselor. Why? Because there's un, unprocessed, dealt with guilt experience and things they need to process with professionally. And that, that part of dealing with the brokenness and stuff they're carrying involves figuring out what is it that symbol contains. And, um, when it, when it happens with a Confederate flag or a Christian flag, which is just kind of weird, um, or the, um, American flag in a sanctuary, there are there are things inside of us that we can't admit are true, and I think Southerners, a lot of them can't admit they lost a war, and that the world they live in is not determined just by white Protestant culture, and this is a way of hearkening back to when we lost that. But the same's true at the liberal Presbyterian Church, where they won't take the stinking flag out of the sanctuary. It is a symbol that everyone that's in here. I just want you all to know. There are members of our family who are more committed to um, this nation's well-being than anything that happens around the communion table. And why a lot of ministers who would agree with your friend and want to move it don't is because they expect a response way more than finding it and putting it back in the sanctuary. They expect a response that comes from people who say uh, in their actions, if not out loud, my real religion is America. Um when the flag it gets pulled out, I don't think I can be here anymore. I, it, it's revelatory of our real situation that um, we either avoid the issue or really want the flag there just as much as it's revelatory that there was a, quote, compromise in South Carolina to move the Confederate flag off the stinking steakhouse to a little bit away. 
just uh, honestly, sometimes the symbols of our heritage belong in a damn museum. It's that simple. <clears throat> I don't look. We're all advocates of free speech. Can can some redneck in Oklahoma stick a, a Dixie flag on his truck and drive around? Yes, he should absolutely have that right. Should the state government put up? I think and, and John Stewart used this phrase last week, and it stuck with me. Racial wallpaper. Should our state governments be allowed to use racial wallpaper? Should they drive on streets named after Confederate generals, go to Stonewall Jackson Elementary? Should they be allowed to do these things as the government, as the symbol of power in the state? No, it's perverse. Should a Jew in Germany have to go into a bakery and find swastika-shaped donuts? They no, actually don't. Well, yeah, no, <laughs> they it's, actually it's, don't. All In Germany, they marked out all the swastikas. Like, you can't uh-huh. go get one. If you go to the flea market to buy used World War II gear – and you get a German anything, the swastika is marked out. No yeah. one there is thinking their freedom's getting shot. They're, it's more like, yeah, that that sucked. And we, like, as a people, decided we don't want symbols of this around. But, you know, I, anyway, they're, they do well, a lot right. of things it's, differently. It's, the, idea is, no, the idea there is that it, it, it is a part of our history, and it should be acknowledged by sticking it in a museum and then saying, but the difference is the German people have learned to be more honest. What's the, it's either Auschwitz or no Auschwitz is Poland, right? It's one of the German camps where it says, you know, is the is the Holocaust an anomaly or is it really who we are? And so they've at least learned to attach the sort of meaning to the symbol, whereas the people in the South are in some sort of weird collective denial, as if the Confederate flag doesn't automatically carry the sort of grammar of racism. You know, it's it's intrinsic to the symbol itself. They want to separate it out and say, no, it's about Southern pride. No, it's not. Southern pride, it's fine. Yes. Is North Carolina a beautiful state? Hell yes, it's a beautiful state. So that, that's different. That's Southern pride. Not, hey, we, you know, once upon a time we rebelled against the United States government. You did because you were dicks, because you wanted to own people. And it's not okay to own people. Yeah. And in, in, the, in, I don't know. So, like, I mean, I know plenty of Southerners, and their response is like, well, yeah, because the Northern economy evolved earlier and blah, 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 blah. It's like, yes, uh, context and history matters. I'm just saying, like, the correct answer to owning people's no. Like, yeah. <laughs> like <laughs> n- does anyone care, like, how long it took you to get there or whatnot? Like, at some point, um, <laughs> it, the answer is just no. Um, but it does, it does lead to a very, very, uh, very important question. Um, uh, that d- is our gay wedding cakes going to undermine uh, uh, religious freedom and um, the, the viability of, of real straight biblical marriages. No question. Absolutely going to happen. I know. Gay, 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 gay wedding cakes. That's sign of the end. I know. Sex. I couldn't see. I don't understand why they pick wedding cake. What about just like a double bachelor party cake? Hmm. Yeah. What would that look like? Two penis cakes. Two penises is what I was going to say too. That's that was too easy. That really was there. But yeah, no. Uh, okay, so you know I live in Oklahoma. I do. And we have, as you probably also know, have had a parade of legislation over the last year uh, from our beloved conservative Christian legislators that are going after uh, gay folks. And I just don't know what to make. I don't know what to make of it. I, I do understand that they feel like the world they love is passing away because in a way it is, but in a way it needs to not in a way it needs to. Right. And so this idea that they're going to protect the the sort of status quo, uh, it it makes no sense to me whatsoever that this is going to end, but the way to do that is not to, I mean, the way to, to fight that is not to create laws that are discriminatory on their face. And so just because you don't have the influence you used to have, doesn't mean you're persecuted. And that should be said to everybody right now who just met at the Southern Baptist Convention over the last week. Uh, I, I was so weary of hearing the stories about how the Christian way of life and Christian values, and, and the worst for it's biblical values. Which ones? What the hell are you talking about? Um, uh, it, ooh, that it, We should have a whole podcast called The Ten Most Awesome Biblical Values. <laughs> no, I totally agree. Because it's like, it becomes one of those empty signifiers where it's like, you have no idea what the hell you're talking about. Uh, when you say something like biblical values. So these people believe that the lack of influence or the waning influence they have is somehow equal to persecution, which is absurd. One of them said, it, like, it's a time to get Bonhoeffer. Say that again? It, one of them said, like, it's a Bonhoeffer time. It's just like a concentration camp. Just exactly the like. Bonhoeffer time. Bonhoeffer tried to assassinate Hitler. 
I really hope gay wedding cakes, like the, the, the response that you have to a gay wedding cake is cor- it correlates to killing someone, gassing millions of people. Like, yes. We, it's I not even hyperbole. It's, it's so bad it's not even hyperbole because they didn't mean it as hyperbole. No, I'm sure. I, I mean, there's probably like a horseman of the apocalypse hidden in like two men holding hand little wedding cake toppers, little little demons and junk in them. I, I, like, t- really, Bonhoeffer time. Yeah. Do you remember who said this? Um, I, I saw it on Twitter, but it was one of the, you know, people that were there. And I'm going to have to, I'll look. But it, I mean, I was like, uh, you got to be kidding this um is is just kind of kind of nuts um oh that's good it was the president of the southern uh, baptist convention um ronnie God. floyd ronnie southern floyd. baptist face a bonhoeffer moment ooh in response to the evil will will they refuse will they refuse to silence their voices in the face of evil like bonhoeffer did and oh plot God. to assassinate Hitler. The lostness has never been greater in our dangerous, hopeless world. Everyone, and I mean everyone, needs to rise up and lead. Does he mean kill gay people? Like Bonhoeffer's going to kill Hitler? Is that what we're talking about? What's the corollary there? I, it's creepy as hell. I, I don't know, but he represents the largest Protestant denomination. Silence in the face of evil is itself evil. God will not hold us guiltless not to speak is to speak not to act aka bonhoeffer time is to act you gotta be kidding me trippy i mean honestly of the people that are assembled there i'm not i'm an idealist you know if you if you want to scale me out on some sort of a metric i i'm I'm, a, I'm an idealist and it's impossible for me to believe that people sitting there in that congregation that day didn't that many of them didn't say what the hell are you talking about this is because that is the most absurd bullshit I've heard all week. And thank you for bringing that to my attention. I will now dwell on it for the rest of the day and be angry at the rest of humanity. Oh, hold on. Let me dramatically read the conclusion. <laughs> oh, yeah. Um, uh, in, in, in discussing the upcoming rulings by the Supreme Court, um, uh, uh, they, they will alter our nation's belief and practice on traditional and biblical marriage, but also our historic commitment to religious liberty for all people. It's already sweeping wildfire of re- of sexual revolution. When other denominations and leaders are beginning to relax their message to become more politically correct, will we rise up in faithfulness to believe and stand on his word for Jesus' name? There is not one government, one Supreme Court, one court case, one editorial, one commenter, one liberal, one conservative, one world leader, one politician, one radical group, one demon, or one of anything that can shut the doors of Jesus if Jesus himself has opened. Oh yeah, um, uh, I don't. Honestly, that sounds like uh, the Richard the Third speech from Independence Day, with a slightly creepy apocalyptic Christian tinge. I, yeah, yeah. I, but what's interesting is I, I I really think that I mean, and this can't be this can't be on. This is a a, a very direct decision to think that somehow. The government legally recognizing marriages of people of the same sex that are celebrated in churches that choose to celebrate them, that is unrelated to making a Southern Baptist minister marry someone they don't want to marry. Um, Like, there are churches and have been for a long time, probably not this guy's church, who took the biblical basis of marriage so seriously they refused to do weddings for anyone with a divorce. Now, I think that's a bit harsh. Um, but at least it's something Jesus talked about, right? Like, yeah. like Jesus talked about not getting divorced. And if he wanted to be hardcore, you would have cried more that people are allowed to get no fault divorces and remarried. Um, if you wanted to, I don't, I mean, unless, unless Jesus is not biblical, like I don't, so to me, there's, there's deliberate deception happening when, when you're communicating the, uh, equality of, for everyone to have the right to marry equals Southern Baptist ministers are going to be forced to perform worship services, blessing marriages. Like how, how do those dots connected without like smoking a joint? 
Honestly, the, the belief that if you're not getting your way, you're being persecuted. It's, it's the religious sort of uh, analogy of, of toddlers. It's toddlers. They're upset. They're not getting their way. And, it's, and, I, and I don't understand this because I think – and here's, here's the – let's be let's have an honest moment. There was a point in my life when I was a conservative evangelical too, and I would have probably made much the same argument. But it's not, not about the whole sort of the Southern Baptists can be forced to marry people they don't want. But this understanding that – uh, the values that we possess as a nation have to come from somewhere, and why not this particular text? But the reality here is much simpler. Can adults in America do anything that any other adult can do in terms of responsibilities, privileges, and rights unless they abrogate one of those you know, sort of rights? And the answer has to be yes. It's a secular sort of place where we get to disagree about religion and still have the same rights and privileges. How difficult is that, honestly? I just don't understand I, I don't know. I don't, so, but I mean, then again, um, uh, recognizing, uh, the veracity of science is hard enough. <laughs> and, and I, I don't know what, like, here's the thing I, I, I don't get. So let's take the, the gay marriage thing. When you're okay. at a progressive Protestant church where this isn't an issue, or whatever the kind of progressive things are, you assume seventy percent of your congregation are friendly to whatever the issue is. Right. Um, there, you still have this weird, creeping anxiety: like, am I going to get the wrong person upset if we get too hardcore on being prophetic about an issue or pushing this or whatnot? Until you get to like the super progressive churches, then you have to bring it up all the time; otherwise, they doubt your street cred. And right. um, and I've talked to minister friends in both uh, in both those churches. Um, where uh well what happens is um either like the particular issues that your congregation is passionate about you preach them and address them all the time you don't talk about candidates or whatever but the other thing that happens is you just assume well you know we there are these two options only one of them doesn't suck so we don't really need to talk about it that much because why why worry so so i I mean, one of the things I'm interested in is how the church that aren't like where a situation where you're kind of just conservative ideologically, how does the church actually inform its members and empower them to use their voice and stuff in our political system, participate in the elections and things without just becoming like a parody of what they're pushing back, right? Like if culture's angry that the religious right just ruins Jesus and the Bible and goes crazy on right-wing politics, how do other uh, Christians that are moderate politically or progressive politically um, say, yes, to be a disciple is to actually use your voice, freedom, and um, input uh, in the system you're paying taxes to? Like you are – that's part of being a good Christian is actually you being responsible for what you have. How do you do that without lapsing into like a parody, the other sides, the, the religious left or something like that? <laughs> I, like, I, I don't know. Like, it is, I, look, I, I think that we have to be honest and say that the, the approach of every minister is is a sort of an ad hoc thing that you choose the things that you care the most about and you tend to focus on those things. Can you do that uh, as a pastor and remain conscientious in terms of not getting engaged in these sort of conflicts that are less than the gospel and are less than, poli- you know, less than politically relevant? So, uh, I mean, honestly, for example, Republicans and Democrats, what can they actually agree on right now? One of the things you've kind of got as a note here, and I won't, we'll get to it, but – I think no matter whether you're Republican or Democrat, if you're just a regular guy or a regular woman and you do your job and you pay your bills and you you know you raise your kids, we can all agree that something like the the sort of plutocratic form of government we have right now is bad for America. Yeah. And it doesn't matter where you are ideologically, you should be opposed to the sort of plutocracy that we're seeing in its growth right now. So can you talk about that in, in a non well, I say in a non sectarian sort of way? Yeah, I think you can. Uh, but you you know, you bring up science a little bit. I would love – and you, you've had more experience in progressive churches. But in evangelical churches, if science is mentioned at all, it, it's usually in a negative way. So can you as the pastor use science to talk about politics? Can you talk about things like you know, climate change? Unfortunately, 
the narrative is being shaped in places that have nothing to do with Christian community or religious communities. It's being shaped by corporations who have vested interests in what the answers are. And so the inability of adult adult humans, for God's sake, to sort out what is what is the, you know, the plutocratic sort of reality of, of climate change versus what is actually good for the planet and their grandchildren and their children, you know, all of that yeah. is, 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 is astounding to me. It's just like it, just because some group on Fox News or on the other side, MSNBC on the left, just because they say that this issue is attached to what it means to be moral and good doesn't mean that it automatically is. But we have lost the ability to have a civil conversation about these things even in churches, and I find that very, very distressing. Yeah, and and it's especially on the progressive side. I think we end up uh, getting overly invested energy wise in a bunch of identity politic issues. Which I mean, I'm progressive on all of them, but I think the way that it it functions is to actually distract or keep progressive Christians from engaging on other topics that are just as important, I guess, to the prophetic voice of Christianity, where you could even have more evangelical allies, right? Like you and I have some mutual friends that are that are Baptists, and if like you were talking to them about identity politic issues, creep them out. If you were talking to them about homelessness in their in their area, um, particularly um, uh, ex military vets who have very significant psychological damage after serving our country that we don't attend to. And now that per that those people in this country represent people Jesus said like when you take care of them you are doing it to me. Like I I feel like there's something that happens where we 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 have like the identity politics things are important but I also think there are these other rather direct commands where we could actually end up serving and working and using our voices together as the church to address stuff where it shouldn't be controversial to to care for um homeless in no. the United States. And then to think, or like, how is it that we work politically and as civic and religious communities so that people that come out of prison get a solid community, the job experience, so they can have a career and not end up back in prison? That shouldn't be political, but, you know, like, so we, there's so many little interests attached to things that we never, as a church, would hang out long enough to address some issues it should be just like plain as day these are things the church should talk about and uh i mean now personally i don't get why climate change isn't one of them um and one of the things i'm interested in for especially hearing what has been said in oklahoma and stuff um after the pope uh you know put out the encyclical um i i read through it it is not crazy i mean the the cliff notes version is basically where he's like there's a lot of ways we're destroying the planet and you list them off. Um, there's a lot. The, did you know that 97% of the scientists all think that human beings are doing this? Did you know the people that get screwed first are the poor? Did you know Jesus doesn't like that? <laughs> now, could we all have one conversation in church? You are empowered and, and, and told, go into your vocations, your careers, your country's place of influence, and advocate for the poor and the planet because Jesus wants you to. Like, it's not even, like, crazy. Like, he's saying, if we don't pay attention, our economic system will keep doing what it's been doing. And if you look at the people in the ditch, then you have to say, if you're on Team Jesus, this isn't cool. So we should do something about it. Like, I, I, it's not a crazy document. It's basically saying, like, you should probably use your brain and then read the Bible and then... The vicar of Christ is like this matters. That's it. The, the the sort of thing that's happening, and, and listen, I agree. I think the guy is tremendous in many ways. He's not as sort of progressive as a lot of folks think he is. And if we talked about sexuality and marriage, that would certainly be that would be clear. Yeah, but you know, how many of us ask celibate eighty year olds about that? Well, that's right. So, and, and yeah, he's clearly better than his predecessor by one hundred eighty eight percent. But. What's happening, I think, in this moment is fascinating to me because what we have now is someone who has great political clout who is saying to the sort of conservative side of our country what you just delineated. And they are so used to religion serving the purpose of the, of the sort of status quo that they've established that this comes across as offensive to them. How dare he speak into this sort of political issue? You – can I say can I say the MF word on here? Because I almost did. You people speak <laughs> the political situation all of the time. 
you're just uncomfortable because it's someone who's saying something that works directly against your means of income, your status quo, the, the sort of, you know, the, the, the centralization of your powers. Oh, and you're right. There's nothing insane about, hey, take care of the poor. And yet we live in a nation where the narrative has to be that the poor are poor because it's their fault. Did you, I don't remember yeah. Jesus addressing whose fault it was. He just said, take care of them. Yeah. And yeah, I, but the, what, here's the thing that really irritates me is a Catholic thinking that their opinion about whether or not they get to listen to the Pope is an opinion that anyone cares about, right? Like you can't be a Catholic and then, and then think that your Catholic doctrine is a reason to force women who want abortions from incest and rape to look at the embryo. Um, like you can't like on church doctrine insist on that crap. And then the moment something that like, I don't know, basically all the scientists agree on and actually kills large numbers of people, Mr. Pro-lifer, you can't right. decide that the Pope can't have an opinion on it, and he doesn't right. have opinions. He's the freaking Pope. You don't – like not caring what the Pope says about something when the Pope writes an encyclical is being a bad Catholic. That's just what it is. You, it's not – you're not – it's not a democracy. It is not. Like you, you are telling everyone that you don't really believe any of it if you think the Pope you can just ignore – that's just just how the game works. I don't know why that's a weird one. That would be like uh, a Baptist just deciding they don't want to read the Bible anymore. Like, yeah, Bible you, change teams. Yes, exactly. If you think your opinion should matter when the Pope has given you one, you're on the wrong team. You're a Lutheran. You're a Lutheran. Hit <laughs> it. I know. I'm just like, come on, come on, Santorum, really, really, and Jeb, Jeb. You converted. That means you actually had to go through catechism as an adult. You want to know what the correct answer to this question is? It means you shut up and pray for repentance and conversion of your mind. That's the correct response. Trip, this is this is that moment that it happens all the time. And as a journalist, I find it maddening. And it 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 happens all the time. And that is, if I say I'm something, am I that thing? And in America, the de facto answer to that question is yes. So if I say I'm a Catholic and I think the Pope's full of shit, am I still a Catholic? Yep. You get to choose. You get to say what you are. If I if I eat pork sandwiches at a strip club and knock back whiskey, then fly planes into buildings and kill innocent people the next day and say I'm a Muslim, am I a Muslim? Well, yeah, that's how you identify as you're a Muslim. Can we please have a standard where we're able to say, I know you think that's what you are, but you're clearly not that thing. Yeah. But that is the entire sort of orientation we have in this culture towards self-identification. If you say it, you have the right. And the dirtiest word in the English language quickly is becoming opinion. Mm -hmm. That's just the Pope's opinion. Well, you can't listen. You're a Catholic. The Pope doesn't have opinions. Well, he, he does. They're just not encyclicals. He tells his yeah. friends, and you don't know about them. <laughs> if the Pope says, I don't like pizza, then that's his opinion. right? But that's not the same thing as saying you should care for the poor. That's not an opinion. So I just don't. This whole idea of individualism in Christianity or individualism in any religion, I, the, the guy, the national director for CARE, his name is going to elude me right now, uh, C-A-I-R, you know, that, that group. I'm, I, interviewed him, I interviewed him a couple of months ago, and I asked him the same question. If someone says they're Muslim and they do these things that are counter to Islam, are they still Muslim? And he, he said the exact same thing that any cracker-ass American would say. Well, yeah, that's that's his that, that's you know it's between him and Allah, of course. But they, they 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 may be a bad one, but they are that thing. Oh my God, we have got to get to a point where we say not only are you not good at being a Christian, you're just not a Christian. Uh, well, it's, it, it's one of those. Um, I, I mean, Kierkegaard does this when he's critiquing Denmark, where like if the word means nothing, then there's just not one anymore, right? Like yes. if everyone in Denmark's a Christian, then there's just not one. It all, but what that meant was if the word says absolutely nothing about the human being who it's being applied to, then it doesn't mean anything anymore. Correct. And, and so, so, like, the phrase Christian should be attached to someone whose existence and way of being in the world is uh, uh, at least shows some evidence that one has given oneself to uh, God as mediated by Jesus or whatever you want to talk about it involves faith. And um, and a way of being in the world. Yeah, yeah. I don't. I yeah. It's frustrating. But the 
the thing I'm excited about with the the Pope's encyclical and the way it's even being received in by progressive Christians is like I've heard four or five friends of mine that are kind of more popular progressive Christian types. And one of the coolest things I noticed this time, unlike previous times, Protestants engaged Catholics is they were even comfortable saying the places where they disagreed with the Pope in the encyclical. To me, it's it. That's a sign of positive where you can go like, hey, you know, we we're supportive, we're agreeing the Pope or follow. We want to uh, follow his invitation to connect here, but we're not going to go there when it goes to uh, birth control or what. You right. know, like the, to me, that sounds like the beginning of a genuine conversation across difference to unite in places we can, where you're st- you're you're not going to ignore places you disagree with the other. Like you and I are having a conversation, but I'm not pretending that that uh i'm a, an ordained minister and you've uh left the fold and now i'm like oh i can't let's just ignore the fact that we're in very different places we are you're in oklahoma i'm in california uh i'm an ordained minister you have left the church like and those mean different things for us but right. we're still able to have a conversation and yes. uh i to me that's real exciting i don't i i don't know why i noticed it and thought that's refreshing but to me it sounded like let's let the pope lead the church and be the Pope leading the Catholic church and not just find the random bits of his social policy. We like and pat him on the back for it. No, that's right. And I knew I was going to like this guy. And you're right. If we sat down and fleshed out everything that Pope and I disagreed on when it came to women and birth control, and that kind of stuff, we would not get along. But when it, when he started talking about things like very simple things like, Hey, gay, let's not be dicks to gay people. It's like, <laughs> wait a second. That's really, that's what a crazy idea. And I, you know, I refer to this person all the time as silly Jesus because he says all this stuff and Christians don't take him seriously. It's like, you have a couple of choices here. Either he means what he says or he's just silly Jesus. Uh, and you treat him like silly Jesus all the time. And when it comes to this issue of, you know, care for the poor, and, 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 well, there's a thousand issues there. Then you don't get to choose just, you know, it's like it's not Jesus' opinion that you should take care of. Them. Well, that's what Jesus thought. I think something different. Well, who that? Now we're talking about authority. I mean, honestly, I'm so tired of Christians relying on Jesus as Savior, and that's it. Okay, you've saved me, Lord. Just you know, shut the hell up because i got some shit to do here, and it looks just like whatever polit- political system I prefer. And so he no longer needs to speak into to us or into our lives. He only functions as this sort of bloody offering so that God's not pissed off at me anymore, and I get to go to heaven and be bored for a shit ton of years in eternity. <laughs> that's the gospel. Sorry, that was my gospel in a nutshell. Well... <laughs> It's always good to have the gospel in a nut and um, shell. And oh my. you know, one of the things I, I want to do at some point, I just finished all the edits on my Jesus book that comes out in November. Um, the homebrewed Christianity guide to Jesus, liar, Lord, lunatic, or just freaking awesome. And I go for the so fourth. Limit, yeah. I go for the fourth option. <laughs> <laughs> um, which which I do define ontologically in the opening chapter, nonetheless. Um, awesome. Uh, no, but uh, I I want I want to get I want to send it to you, but I I want you to talk to me about it, and uh, I'm I'm just interested in how you respond, and then and and what you'll decide to give me a hard time on, and not. Uh-huh. Um, it'll be fun. Oh, this is this is already sounds fun. I'm already excited. I know. Oh, maybe maybe we can do it around something where I'm in that area so we can do it in person again because I had fun last time we were there. It was awesome. Yeah, with like beer and wine and like that kind of thing, yeah. Well, you know, anytime you get uh, um, uh, Todd and Charlie and everyone, uh, Damien, we're all organizing it. It was a, it was a, it was a soiree. It was. I remember I had Lambrusco. People should drink more Lambrusco. It's delicious. Not the stuff that comes in a jug. Don't drink that. Drink the stuff that comes in a bottle. I'm not getting paid for that. I'm not getting paid for that either. I, just, I want to make the human race better and the planet a better place. Drink Lambrusco. There you go. Well, uh, thank you very much for hanging out and talking about this. We will uh, we will be uh, giving you some end of religion audio soon, and then um, uh, Greg and I will get back together uh, to to talk about the end of religion, which is really depressing. Giving uh, my income stream, I. Uh, I <laughs> Sorry, but oh well. Anyway, <laughs> <All right. laughs> any parting words, Greg? Uh, 
Well, yeah, I'm with you. you know, about half of what I write about as a journalist is religion. So if it ends, that, that's part of my review stream too, sir. So. Just more wine reviews. Yeah, well, yeah, and I'll keep drinking the wine for y'all. That's what I, I do it for you. So that you will, yeah, what to drink. You know, like everyone has their cross to bear, you know what I'm saying? Yeah, it's a vocation. Uh-huh. It really is. Yeah, yeah. It's totally true. You put the, well, you put your hand to that plow. You do not look back. Listen, we just re- we just did ju- we just judged this, a, a, a small wine competition in Oklahoma, and of the seventy wines, there were sixty you should never ever drink. So that did feel like they were from Oklahoma, though. Bonhoeffer moment. <laughs> it was a Bonhoeffer moment <laughs> in wine. <laughs> I did. All right. Anyway. All right.